I used to work as the HR head for a multinational company called Tupperware for India operations. And I was also leading the worldwide HR projects. So recently I quit and I started my own HR consultancy. Okay. And apart from that, I also act as a strategic advisor to Ethica and you know my Swish. So I'm pleased to have this session with you today. And you know, this particular session is a workshop that I personally have attended and I have learned from that workshop. This was a workshop before the pandemic, you know, which was conducted in the US. This was a three-day workshop. I tried to compress that into one hour. So, you know, we'll go quite fast. And hopefully we will have a couple of things that we can learn. Done? Are we all set? Can I start now? Great. You know, firstly, thanks firstly for switching on your camera. You know, I feel I'm talking to someone. <laughs> okay, I prefer and, it this way, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And this other way, yes. also, if possible, please switch on your cameras. You know, even if you are at home in your you know home wear clothes, it's still okay. Don't worry. <laughs> That's what we spend most of the day, uh, you know, with this. So Rewrite your life story and powerfully transform your life. Okay. So if we have to rewrite our life story, let's assume our life is, you know, like a biopic. We're watching our own life like a biopic on a screen. Let's visualize our life for a few minutes. Let's start off at our childhood. Okay. What were our childhood dreams? Can anyone share their childhood dreams? You can either chat or you can talk. When I talk about childhood dreams, it is like, you know, uh, the career, the kind of person that we wanted to become. Our dreams are generally about this, right? About our health and fitness, the relationships that we want to have. So what were your dreams? Was to start, so, my childhood dream was to start our own company. Is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Wonderful. What about, and, and any other dreams, Jay Chandra? Uh, that was the biggest thing that I had. So uh, I did, that was the biggest thing that I had. Okay. So I didn't. Okay. Fine. What about others? You know, it's, it's nice to share our childhood dreams. Let me share mine. Okay. When I was a very little child, I still remember in the school, when my teacher was asking all the students, "What child? What are dreams?" At that point, I told that I want to become the prime minister. Okay. okay. <laughs> so you know, which looks silly if we look back now. So don't worry. You know, please feel free to share. And then after a couple of years, I wanted to become a movie director. And a couple of years down the line, I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And there it stopped, I guess. I, I stopped, probably I stopped changing my dreams after that. So, you know, everyone, please feel free to share yours. And then from a personality perspective, you know, I always, uh, right from childhood, I always idolized Mahatma Gandhi. Okay, so I wanted to become an a person like him with a similar kind of values and you know uh, that from a health perspective I wanted to be very agile and fit. So these are some of my childhood. Now that you learned my secrets, don't keep your secret. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Anyone else? Okay, yeah. So my dream, yeah, as you shared. Okay, was, yeah. So my dream, yeah, as you shared was to be an actor and uh, to be an actor down the line. And uh, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Down the line. I wanted to be a okay. fashion designer. And then now, yeah, I'm in IT. So and then now, stopped. yeah, I'm in IT. So kind of okay. it has stopped. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. Okay. Fine. Anyways, I think uh, thanks a lot for uh, sharing your dreams, Neha. Okay, and anyway, I think uh, whatever are our dreams, just close your eyes, eyes and visualize the kind of life that you imagined when you were a child. 
Okay. There were no constraints in breathing when we were children, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is let's let's visualize our life. You know, when we were children, the way we imagined our life, what we would be as adults, you know, what we would be doing, what kind of people we would become, the relate what kind of relationships we'd be having, you know, the amount of happiness, freedom, everything. Just imagine where you aspire to be. And then try to imagine your life story in about one minute or two minutes till this point, till the point where we are today as we sit. What is it like? You know, a childhood dreams vis-a-vis adulthood reality. You know, I would request you to chat or you know speak up. What 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 uh, is the adulthood reality in comparison to childhood dreams? Sometimes it feels like a sad story. I mean. Yeah, initially it feels like everything is possible and then maybe you put your own restrictions on yourself and then you become a completely different person. Yeah, okay, fine. You know, that's some part of our journey, right? There are some areas that we do well. Mm-hmm. There are some areas where mm-hmm. we are struggling and things are not as we wish them to be. Okay, and we are leading, leading a life in a particular way. But, you know, a couple of things probably which are common to adulthood are the number of dreams that we had as children, unbounded dreams, have come down. Now we see a lot of boundaries to our dreams. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Right. And, you know, the areas that we are not doing well, many times we get adjusted to those areas rather than trying to change them. We have accepted them as, you know, a reality of life in many cases. Am I right? Yes. Okay. And some things that we are doing well anyways, I think we are definitely enjoying that. So, if I may ask, if you may quantify our childhood dream as 100% and if we quantify what the way we are living today, Vis-a-vis those dreams, what percentage of our dreams are accomplished, or, or what what percentage of uh, you know our dreams have we are we living? You know, I can share mine as usual, but then you know this time, yeah, please, thank you, thanks, Jay Chandran. Less than ten percent, okay, okay, twenty percent, okay. Oh, you're being very tough on yourself, okay. I I I think I'm living. Probably at around 50% of you know, my dreams. Okay, I would not say uh, in our lives are very tragic, but they're not what we wanted them to be. We will not reach our full potential power in many, many areas. Right? Why is it so? And what should we do from now? So I, I just want to say a few things here. So basically, uh, when you talk about childhood dreams, that means we have, in the, as a child, we have lots of dreams. Like, I wanted to become cricketer also. I wanted to become pilot also. I wanted to become scientist also. So there were like, like all the dreams were cluttered. But as we grow up, we actually uh, go ahead and fine tune things based on the available resources. And then we work on them. We focus on them. And then we achieve what we, you know, are today. So it's actually how we shape our dreams and how we take decisions in those times. So it totally depends on how I always wanted to be a cricketer and, you know, pilot and everything. But at the same time, I also wanted to be a scientist and I became a scientist. I was interested in both science and finance. So then I, I it was not possible at that time to, you know, choose both subjects because no college in the world teaches both subjects, right? So at some point you have to choose and then you have to pursue your interest side by side and then, you know, learn business as well as science. And then that's how I uh, shaped up my life. I learned good things and that's how I'm here today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think our dreams can change. It's not necessary that we stick to the same dream throughout our life. Okay. But the point is to what potential of our life are we living are we living 50%, 100%? And what should be our aspiration? I think we should aspire to live, say, 200%. Right? Why should there be any compromise in life? We have one life, unique life, unless we believe in rebirth. Okay? We have one life. So why should we not live our life to the best potential? And if, you know, we are living at, say, 50% or 20% or 60%, whatever, 
That means we are not utilizing the opportunity called life fully. So what should we do? Why, why does this happen? Okay. And you know, just a point to mention, uh, you know, Karthik, you said you wanted to become a pilot. Okay. There was research, you know, in life, 2019, there was a study uh, done in Britain about what is the childhood dream of most people. So most men, you know, becoming a pilot, becoming an athlete were the dreams of most men. Okay. And in the female uh, category, mostly it was a teacher. Or surprisingly in the UK, I don't know if there are any cultural uh, tones to it, they wanted to become a veterinary doctor. Okay. And the study also revealed that only 4% of the people pursue their childhood dreams. Okay. Whereas 64% of the people still want to pursue the childhood dreams even after they have become adults and you know in the current situation. And the study also revealed that people who pursued childhood dreams, you know, when we say childhood, it doesn't mean when we were very tall, you know, very little, probably even in our early teens, uh, the chances of a person being unhappy are twice. The chances, uh, no, when, when you have pursued your childhood dreams, these are when you have not pursued your childhood dreams. That means if you have pursued, pursued our childhood dreams, the percentage of chances that we will be unhappy are 8%, whereas if we have not pursued, it is 16%. That's what that particular study has revealed, and the sample size in that study was around 1567 adults. Again, okay. so having said that, so why do we reach a stage where you know we are living uh, in at least in some areas a compromised life? Let's go through the journey that we have most of it. Okay? This holds good for the majority of the people. Our life can be divided into three phases. The phase one is the childhood phase, where we are growing and developing. We are developing emotionally, the development is physical in nature. And even intellectually. And who drives this growth? Predominantly our parents and teachers, right? We, we learn what our teachers teach us. Uh, we live in the neighborhoods where our parents want us to. We study what our parents, you know, in schools where our parents have got us admitted, so on and so forth. And you know, what we learn depends on our parents, on the parenting of our parents. And during that stage, we have a lot of inter internal enthusiasm and openness. We believe that anything is possible. Sounds true? Okay. Okay. And then we got into the second phase of life. This is the period where whatever we have learned intellectually, emotionally, and physically, okay, during our education, etc. We started applying them. And this is a phase when growth has slowed down. Only few people who choose to still grow, who focus on growth, are growing. And for majority of the people, for a good number of people, good percentage of people, the growth has either slowed down or stopped. So again, the, fo the focus is, you know, career, the focus is family. And life patterns become set during this stage, and our expectations got torn down. We call that being practical and being realistic. But is that the real reality? Let's 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 see. And settling becomes the norm. We want to settle, right? Our parents say, you know, my, my child is settling you now. So this is the second phase of life. And then we enter the third phase of life. The third phase of life is a phase when we have procured. We are now harvesting whatever we have on days or whatever we have learned. You know, this third phase is probably around the 30s and beyond. Okay. Uh, only 3% of the population have written plans about what they want to do. They have clear cut vision about what they, where they want to go from where they are. 97% of the people simply follow the path they are on mechanically. They are just going through life predominantly in a passive way. 
and they and we get into something called entrench thinking. Can anyone share what you take from entrench thinking? What is meant by entrench thinking? No. Anyone wants to share? The entrench thinking, I, I'll explain that with an example. In many parts of the world, wherever we elephants are paid, we see a huge mighty elephant being managed by a tiny person. Right? The elephant is listening to that person, obeying the orders of that person, not trying to escape, not trying to return. What happens? How did the elephant reach that stage? What happens is when the baby elephant is captured, the baby elephant is tied to a tree with big chains. Okay? The, the, the baby tried to you know, escape, the baby tried to break through the ropes and the foundations. But it, it, you know, obviously it has failed because the, the chain was much stronger. As the baby grew, as the baby elephant becomes older, it has given up. Okay, its will to escape has gone down because its belief has gone down. And as it has grown up, and it has, its physical strength has in fact increased. In spite of that, the elephant tamers try the elephant with very small ropes, with very weak ropes. And since the elephant has never tried to escape. Okay. Now the elephant believes that it is a slave of circumstances. It is a slave of the person who is training her or him. Okay. Obeys the orders and leaves the life of slavery. Now what is entrance thinking? Believing that we are a slave of circumstances or we are, you know, or, or just passing through life within the constraints that we believe are the constraints. That is called entrance. So in the third phase of life, many people get into this thing called the entrance thing. Okay. Whereas the psychologists and scientists in the recent last few decades have discovered that a growth mindset is possible at any age. Okay. What we'll do is I, I request Lakshmi to post a small you know, questionnaire here. We'll, we'll just take five minutes to go through that question. Okay, you can just download it and fill it, and then we'll have a discussion. Let's take five minutes. You know, there are just eight questions. You can directly go to page number three. You can read the rest of the pages later on. Just go to page number three, answer the eight questions, and calculate the average of your response. Some questions are phased in the reverse manner, so just go through the questions. Later. Once you are done, if you are comfortable, please post your score.
So basically, you know, this questionnaire is to understand whether we have more, we are more towards the growth mindset or we are more towards the fixed mindset. Until recently, you know, until a few decades ago, even scientists used to believe after a particular age, intellectuality does not grow. But then recent developments in science have proved otherwise. Let's let's you know go through a YouTube short YouTube video. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more, and this new way of thinking, feeling, or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. Yeah, so the basic point that we're trying to drive is that at whichever stage of life we are at currently, okay, our brain, intellectuality and talent can keep growing. There is no fixed intellectuality, you know, intelligent range, or there is no fixed talent. People who believe that talent and intellectuality can be grown at any age are said to be having growth mindset. And growth mindset is considered to be the most critical factor for adulthood success. Now, this was uh, the growth mindset phrase was coined by a psychologist from Stanford University. Her name is Carol Dweck, okay? You can see her YouTube videos. She, uh, you know, her talks in Google and uh, even her talks on TED. You will understand what is growth mindset versus fixed mindset. They've done a lot of research on students in this area and they found that students who are doing having growth mindset are doing much better than students who are not having growth mindset. And the same holds good for adults well. So now, Another, you know, one small question is, can anyone identify what picture this is? What is this picture? Is it the is right, brothers? right brothers? Yeah, it is the right brothers. Okay. It is the right brothers with the first aeroplane. And you know, the first aeroplane was uh, completed. The project was completed in 1905. Predominantly, there was between 1903 and 1905 on the manufacturing first aeroplane. Do you know what they were doing before that? They were having a bicycle repair shop and sales shop. In 1996, they were running a bicycle repair and sales shop. They were fully grown adults in their early 30s, but that's what they were doing. And you know, try, you know, imagine what from where they went to which point. They made history, right? That's because they did not believe that they have foundations. Okay? So now, how do we rewrite our story? What should we do in order to, uh, you know, rewrite a parallel story for ourselves? How do we rewrite our, the rest of our life in a much better, to become a much better version than what it has been so far? Because irrespective of how well we are doing or how badly we are doing, we can always 
make a fresh beginning and do better than we are, what we are doing, right? So the number one point is mindset. Okay, all things begin in mind. Can you tell something on earth, you know, that exists in reality on earth, which is not being conceived in someone's mind before? There's only one thing actually. Accidents. You know, except accidents. Everything else that exists on earth that we experience today has been conceived by someone of the other in their brain before it became a reality. Okay. So similarly, our life, unless we have a particular mindset and a particular vision for the rest of our life, our life, the life that happens to us will happen by chance and not by design. That is point number one. Point number two is mindset is not static, it is dynamic. Right? Because every day we get exposed to billions of bytes of data in some form or the other. And all these things, as they enter our consciousness, they keep changing our mindset unless we cultivate our mindset consciously. Otherwise, we get influenced by the external circumstances. So it is important to grow and cultivate the kind of mindset that we want to have. And, you know, the current result or current life of us is a result of the current mindset. Right? So if we want to have a rewritten story or a better story for ourselves, what should we have? A new mindset. A new mindset will lead to a new result. Now, what should be that mindset? One is, it should be a growth mindset. Right? We should believe that change and growth are possible in terms of intellectuality, in terms of talent, at any stage of our life. Now, earlier I was talking about the research that happened in Britain, right? Silo dreams versus adulthood reality. 43% of the people who did not pursue their dreams, okay, the dreams that they wanted, believe that it is because they cannot change the circumstances. They do not have enough talent. They do not have the resources. So uh, we have to cultivate a growth mindset where happiness is part of the quest. And we, we cultivate it around the purpose. And we look at our life as an adventure rather than a, you know, something that we have to pass through. Because what happens is as children, we were dynamic because we were, we were eager to learn. We were hungry to learn. We were hungry to acquire something, do something. But as adults, generally, if you notice the mindset, what happens is we are insecure about loss. We think we don't know, we don't want to lose something. We don't want to lose the relationship. We don't want to lose the skill. We don't want to lose our properties, our financial status, so on and so forth. Because we are living life with a sense of, you know, in order to protect ourselves from loss, what is happening is we are not moving forward as much as we can. So if we look at life as an adventure, then, you know, life becomes uh, really worthwhile. What to be the best version of self? And then also the other important point is learning zone versus performing zone. So as adults, we have, like we discussed earlier, we are applying the knowledge that we have acquired through our childhood as adults and performing something, right? So as adults, what do you think? Should we live in performing zone or should we live in learning zone? Now, I'll share a short video, okay, which talks about the difference between performance zone and learning zone. Most of us go through life trying to do our best at whatever we do, whether it's our job, family, school, or anything else. I feel that way. I try my best. But some time ago, I came to a realization that I wasn't getting much better at the things I cared most about, whether it was being a husband, or a friend, or a professional, or teammate. And I wasn't improving much at those things, even though I was spending a lot of time working hard at them. I've since realized from conversations I've had and from research that this stagnation, despite hard work, turns out to be pretty common. So I'd like to share with you some insights into why that is and what we can all do about it. What I've learned is that the most effective people and teams in any domain do something we can all emulate. 
they go through life deliberately alternating between two zones, the learning zone and the performance zone. The learning zone is when our goal is to improve. Then we do activities designed for improvement, concentrating on what we haven't mastered yet, which means we have to expect to make mistakes, knowing that we will learn from them. That is very different from what we do when we're in our performance zone, which is when our goal is to do something as best as we can, to execute. Then we concentrate on what we have already mastered, and we try to minimize mistakes. Both of these zones should be part of our lives, but being clear about when we want to be in each of them, with what goal, focus, and expectations, helps us better perform and better improve. The performance zone maximizes our immediate performance, while the learning zone maximizes our growth and our future performance. The reason many of us don't improve much, despite our hard work, is that we tend to spend almost all of our time in the performance zone. This hinders our growth, and ironically, over the long term, also our performance. So what does the learning zone look like? Take Demosthenes, a political leader and the greatest orator and lawyer in ancient Greece. To become great, he didn't spend all his time just being an orator or a lawyer, which would be his performance zone, but instead he did activities designed for improvement. Of course, he studied a lot. He studied law and philosophy with guidance from mentors, but he also realized that being a lawyer involved persuading other people, so he also studied great speeches and acting. To get rid of an odd habit he had of involuntarily lifting his shoulder, he practiced his speeches in front of a mirror, and he suspended a sword from the ceiling so that if he raised his shoulder, it would hurt. <laughs> to speak more clearly despite a lisp, he went through his speeches with stones in his mouth. He built an underground room where he could practice without interruptions and not disturb other people. And since courts at the time were very noisy, he also practiced by the ocean, projecting his voice above the roar of the waves. His activities in the learning zone were very different from his activities in court, his performance zone. In the learning zone, he did what Dr. Anders Ericsson calls deliberate practice. This involves breaking down abilities into component skills, being clear about what subskill we're working to improve, like keeping our shoulders down, giving full concentration to a high level of challenge outside our comfort zone, just beyond what we can currently do using frequent feedback with repetition and adjustments, and ideally engaging the guidance of a skilled coach, because activities designed for improvement are domain-specific, and great teachers and coaches know what those activities are and can also give us expert feedback. It is this type of practice in the learning zone which leads to substantial improvement, not just time on task, performing. For example, research shows that after the first couple of years working in a profession, performance usually plateaus. This has been shown to be true in teaching, general medicine, nursing, and other fields. And it happens because once we think we've become good enough, adequate, then we stop spending time in the learning zone. We focus all our time on just doing our job, performing, which turns out not to be a great way to improve. But the people who continue to spend time in the learning zone do continue to always improve. The best salespeople at least once a week do activities with the goal of improvement. They read to extend their knowledge, consult with colleagues or domain experts, try out new strategies, solicit feedback, and reflect. The best chess players spend a lot of time not playing games of chess, which would be their performance zone, but trying to predict the moves grandmasters made and analyzing them. Each of us has probably spent many, many, many hours typing on a computer without getting faster. But if we spend 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes each day fully concentrated on typing 10 to 20% faster than our current reliable speed, we would get faster, especially if we also identify what mistakes we're making and practice typing those words. That's deliberate practice. In what other parts of our lives, perhaps that we care more about, are we working hard but not improving much because we're always in the performance zone? Now, this is not to say that the performance zone has no value. It very much does. When I needed knee surgery, I didn't tell the surgeon, poke around in there and focus on what you don't know. <laughs> we'll learn from your mistakes. I looked for a surgeon who I thought would do a good job, and I wanted her to do a good job. Being in the performance zone allows us to get things done as best as we can. 
It can also be motivating, and it provides us with information to identify what to focus on next when we go back to the learning zone. So the way to high performance is to alternate between the learning zone and the performance zone, purposefully building our skills in the learning zone, then applying those skills in the performance zone. When Beyonce is on tour, during the concert, she's uh -huh. in her... And I also post another video with by Carol Dweck herself on YouTube. Uh, you can watch that also. So what we're trying to say here is, as adults, we focus more on performance. We are passionate and uh, always uh, want to perform better and better. But with what we have learned, we have reached a particular performance stage. And then if you have noticed, most people, after having reached a particular level, stay at that level of performance. In order to go beyond and further improve and change life for the better, we need to alternate between learning zone and performing. So that is another important aspect of rewriting our, you know, because if we are performing at a particular stage with our particular skill set, are we going to rewrite our life in a different way? No. The most important thing is also like, you know, we discussed earlier, only 3% of the population of people have a life plan at all. 97% of the population go through life just like that, in a very passive way. Life happens to them. They don't make life happen. Okay, so create a life plan. In order to create a life plan, first know yourself fully well. Forget about the you know limitations. Think freely and know what excites you. And after knowing what excites you, think why it excites you. Because as children, we have the luxury of the flexibility to changing our plans. But as adults, we can't do that so much. Maybe we can do it, but not so much. Right? So think why, think, be sure before maybe writing it on a play, uh, on a piece of paper. And make sure that that's what you really want. And then set five or days. In a one day workshop or a three days workshop, what generally happens is we take workbooks and we prepare our life plan then and there. Okay, by the end of the workshop, each of us will have a, a life plan. But here, since that's not possible, what I would suggest is after the workshop, you could take a book or even better, you could download. There are so many apps on Play Store, okay, which can help us write our life plan and then track it. And then the, uh, the, the apps are so good that they send us affirmations, they follow up with us. They ensure that we don't deviate from the track. Okay, so we could use any of these tools and prepare the right life plan. And then ensure that we have passion powered energy. What is passion powered energy? You know, energy and uh, this person, they're not synonymous, right? Can, I, can someone say who is this? This is Stephen Hawking, the most, you know, the world's best or most famous theoretical physicist of our times. For most part of his life, he suffered from something called cerebral palsy and he was bound to a wheelchair. He could not move any of his body parts. So energy does not associate with him physically. But he was so passionate that in spite of all these problems, in spite of all the limitations, his energy was powered by the passion for his subject. And he achieved things which, you know, probably no one else has achieved in this generation. So ensure that our energy is powered by passion. It's not powered by temporary, uh, you know, motivations or temporary, motiv uh, temporary temptations, which are not our passion areas in the long run. The other important thing is also, you know, smart kids are not always most successful. Quite often they are and quite often they are not. Why? Now again, there's a research that says that in order to be successful, one of the most important qualities is grit. Grit is whatever we start, whatever we take up, sticking to it until we see the end of it. People who have this particular quality do better in life. Many of the people who give up, gave up on their goals have given up because in the beginning, in every journey, there is a learning phase, a learning curve, during which we face difficulties, during which we fail. And we have given up during that stage. But beyond that stage is what lies actually real success and enjoyment. 
So people who have grit pass through that stage and reach the next stage. People do who do not have grit give up during that stage. Okay, now how do we build grit? We build, we can build grit by ensuring that our goals are aligned with the values that we need. By ensuring that our goals are they coming out of deep desire and not just based out of temporary temptations. And they are aligned to deliberately develop the habits. And another important thing is to ensure that we have small periodical wins in our journey. Okay, and we celebrate those periodical wins. So that, that gives us the energy to go to the next milestone. And then, you know, cultivate authentic relationships. While social media relationships are good to have, are helpful, okay, it is important to have authentic relationships. Because it is said that you are an average of the five people with whom you have spent most of your time. Okay? So it is important to carefully choose our relationships, you know, based on what we want, where we want to go, where we want to be in our life. And do not just seek friends, seek comrades in arms. Seek comrades in arms is, you know, people who are on a similar mission as you. The moment you associate with such people, Search and find such people. Okay, the moment you associate with such people, your journey towards your goal, your journey on the mission that you want to take up will not be tiresome. You will not be alone on the journey. Okay, so that's another important aspect. And then the other important thing is positive mental sense. In today's world, you know, in today's world is I think a little bit more difficult than the world that we had two years ago after the pandemic has come, okay? It is very, very important to keep ourselves positive. Now, why do we have Nelson Mandela here? Nelson Mandela, I think, is the history's most prominent person when it comes to cultivating a positive mental state. I'll explain how. Nelson Mandela was kept in jail by a racist government for how much? For how long? 27 long years. For no crime of his. The root cause is racism. Okay. Now, 27 years later, he comes out. What would a person think about his opponents who kept him in jail for 27 years because of racism? What would be the mindset? You know, 99.99% of the time, it would be to retaliate. Right, because the other uh, race was a minority in his country, so it was very easy for him to you know, harness the anger in his people and in himself to form his government and then suppress the other race after you know, after the country has been suppressed for so long. But what he did is he came out and he announced that he is not for racism, even the other way around. He ensured that his country does not get into any kind of racism. And he ensured that the country is built on coexistence in a harmonious manner. That was not easy to convince his people. If anyone has seen a movie called Invictus, okay, it's a sports movie, we know how he achieved that. He achieved that through sports, through the sport of football. Okay, if someone is able to achieve that level of positive, man, uh, positive thinking, I think we can easily achieve enough positive thinking to you know, cultivate the life that we want to, right? Now, how we can do that? By ensuring that we have positive affirmations day in, day out. Now, these days, we have a lot of positive affirmations available. You know, every day on WhatsApp in the morning, if you open, you have a lot of messages. We are flooded with them, actually. The other most important thing is to have affiliations. Affiliations with mentors and role models of people who are who have been there where we are aspiring to be. People who have been on a mission that we are on currently. Okay? And then last but not the least, taking responsibility. You know, like I said, 43% of the people believe that they are not they are not where they want to because of themselves, because of their choices and their decisions. They believe it is because of circumstances. Okay. The moment we take responsibility for our decisions and choices. And we believe that we are a product of our decisions and not circumstances. We start taking responsibility and we make 
changes in ourselves which will catapult us towards the life that we want to have. So we need to cultivate the victim versus the warrior mindset. What does the victim do when faced with difficulty? The victim generally succumbs to that difficulty, kneels down and complains about, about the difficulty. What does the warrior do? The warrior fights back, deals with the difficulty, faces it. Right? And who, who comes out as winner? Obviously the warriors, right? So cultivating that kind of a mindset, never give up, like we said, grit. And then more importantly, check your self-talk. You know, these are self-talk. This is where it boils down. We discussed in the beginning, entrenched thinking is a result of a negative self-talk or lack of self-talk in many cases. So check your self-talk and ensure that your self-talk is moving you towards your goals and not moving you back. There is a particular tool, okay, uh, a word document which I will share uh, on the WhatsApp group if you uh, download it and use it. You can fill that questionnaire. You can use that tool to you know, check your self-talk and cultivate a better self. Okay. And finally, have a life plan, cultivate a growth mindset, and cultivate a new skill set by being by blending your learning zone with the performance zone. So that is what it is about today. Now, any questions? So uh, it, it talks about uh, how we should change. Uh, you know, the brain should uh, how we should. I mean, I'm not able to put the question across. How do you ch- make your brain change and, you know, alter- start alternating and thinking in a different way? How do you make that happen? Are, are there any exercises or an- is there a tool to do this? Okay. So, I think what uh, the research has revealed is that our brain is like a muscle. Okay. <clears throat> Whatever we spend most of the time on, that part of our brain grows. For example, there's a study that was done on, again, you know, London cab drivers. The drivers who've been driving in the streets of London for a, 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 a lot of years, that part of the brain that navigates between places, that navigates us between places, has grown in them. Okay. Similarly, whatever we spend most of our time on, that part of our brain starts growing and getting better. So whatever we want, it's simply about having the grit and practicing it. There are no shortcuts for this. Okay. It's about putting in that day in and day out effort to practice what we want. Now, did I answer your question? Yes. So you're saying that constant practice and constant learning. Yes. yes. Understood. Because, you know, brain is like uh, any other muscle. If we exercise, our muscle grows. Which are part of our body exercises the most? That particular muscle group. Same is the case with the brain. Hi, Rupa. Uh, you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. I have a small question. You are more quoting on the grid. So, grid is nothing but our planner and, you know, how do no, you. No, plan? I'm talking about grid. G R I G R I T, grid. G R I T. Okay. Grid okay. is. Okay, I'm sorry if I have mispronounced this. I'm really sorry. Okay, no, grid no, no, is no, the no, quality. No. Because of it, we do not give up. Okay. okay. We stick to whatever we are doing and we keep trying until we succeed. Okay. That is called great. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, I will also share again, you know, I, I think I am talking about too many videos here because these videos are actually spread over three days. Okay. There is a, a video TED Talk by a person called Angela Duckworth, which talks about great. It, it is a very immensely popular video. Okay, I'll post that video also in the WhatsApp group. I would request you to go through it. Fine, I hope you liked the session and found something to learn from. Okay, if you want to share any feedback, please share. We'll be grateful to any feedback that needs to improve. I just wanted to say it's a wonderful session, good insights, and a good thought process. Very nice. Thank you so much, Rupa. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.